kick off speaking things at a, a, a you know a place on site that was dreadful until I got there and then I was so glad it was it's so cool it's so nice how people come to volunteer first Morning. Good morning, Council Member Tao. So I am just um, about, about to kick us off here, but I am um, demoting people from presenter to attendee just helps me keep an eye on my colleagues, um, the order that their hands go up. Um, so if I know, um, Mike, you said that Brad is going to be driving, so I kept him as a presenter. Um, but if anybody else needs trying to present and they cannot, it's because you've been demoted. And I can promote you right back where you started from. So, um, but it just helps me keep an eye on my colleagues. For parks, we should be absolutely fine with that. Okay, cool. Well, we have four in the house. I know we have one excused absence and so we're looking pretty good here this morning. Um, so Holly, if you're ready to go, I don't know if these, do we record these? Um, yes. We, I, as a backup, and then we also have the media people helping us. Okay. So they, they're the live as people. well. <laughs> okay. Um, that sounds great. So we are recording. Uh, so with that, I will call the meeting of the St. Paul City Council Budget uh, Committee 2020 woo, to order. This is our first um, 2020 official uh, council side of the budget uh, process. And so it's exciting. We're kicking this off with our uh, parks department. Today, um, parks is the only item on our agenda. We are working to get through the um, big general fund departments before we set our levy limit. Um, there are a few smaller um, departments that will be coming in ahead of that as well, but that is our intention. Um, in the past, we've asked uh, for a quick overview and then come back if we have questions. And I think we really will um, stick to that. If there's not reason to come in for a second time, there won't be reason to come in for the second time. So um, hopefully we can hit the high marks. Um, Mr. My comments here from the Parks Department, well, Brad Myers here, as well as Tom Russell. Um, and I understand that the rest of the team is watching um, online, so they could jump on in a moment's notice if we have questions for them. Um, so that's good stuff. Um, and then uh, just, I know that you've all done this before, but just um, if you could just at the end of your slides, just take a quick peek up. Um, if there are, are questions, well, I can manage that side of it, but um, you're also welcome to tell us that's coming up in a slide. We do appreciate and acknowledge that we got our materials from you in a timely fashion, um, which helps us prepare for the meeting as well. So thank you so much for that. And unless there are or any other like thoughts, I know um, Ms. Houston is gonna wrap us up here today. So I think um, unless Mr. McCarthy has anything, then we'll kick it off here with Mr. Hum. Welcome and thank you for being here today. Thank you. Um, good morning, council members. Um, Mike Hum, I am the director of the city's parks and recreation department. I'm very excited to be here today to share our Parks and Recreation Operating Budget proposal for 2022. Um, this 2022 budget includes um, all of the continued commitments to essential Parks and Recreation services. Um, as you mentioned, um, Brad Meyer is here uh, driving the PowerPoint. Um, Brad and his team 
um, and our parks and rec management team are the responsible parties for getting all of the um, advanced materials um, ready for you. I am grateful for their help. Um, we have 15 short slides. We're planning to cover highlights and also referencing the supplemental materials that uh, we have provided in, in advance. Um, as always, we want to focus on the highlights of the budget. Um, but you know, there's many complexities, so we'll track any follow-up items or questions that we have not covered here today. Um, Mr. Han, before you get going, I, I'm seeing, I feel like I'm looking into like a hall of mirrors right now. Is that just my screen or are other people experiencing this? Like, I don't even know where to look right now. There's like, a, you know, two of our, two of our screens are up and no presentation. Oh. I think that's on you, Brad. <laughs> How about the audio? Are people able to hear me? Yeah, the audio is fine. It just for it sometimes when you share a screen, it actually reverts to the um, folks watching as opposed to the or the pre the folks on the meeting. This looks there. You go. All right. Thanks for that quick delay. I think it will. I'll be a little happier without looking at the funhouse. All right. Well, we um. I guess we are honored to bat lead off in the budget presentation. So if that's the, um, I'm betting that's not the only technological slip up that uh, that we will have today or throughout these budget presentations. Um, if if we're good to go, we'll move on to um, the second slide and kind of highlight 2021. Um, you know, first of all, what a year it's been. I really want to thank the work of our entire team in Parks and Recreation uh, to be able to accomplish what they've been able to accomplish while um, keeping their coworkers and our participants safe has really been a monumental achievement. Um, I also want to thank on behalf of our entire team, um, this city council, um, the finance staff, um, Mayor Carter's team for supporting our work. I'm sure um, we have not been perfect in executing everything that we've attempted to do this year, but it's been in um, a really uh, interesting and uncharted circumstances, adding programs back. Our, our staff have um, really dug in, done everything they've been asked uh, to do, and we appreciate the support. Um, I also want to acknowledge on the front end, this will be the first budget in the last 12 years where I haven't been here um, forecasting big financial problems and asking for additional help for Emerald Ashbor. Um, I'm sure everybody's grateful for that in this budget presentation. I want to thank this council for their support for Emerald Ashbor and note that um, earlier this year, the council funded a partnership with the St. Paul Port Authority to uh, um, complete our um, Emerald Ashbor um, response plan um, beginning next year and we have a funding solution to complete all those works with removals, reforestation, removals by 2024, reforestation by 2027. So that um, um, that will not be a major focus of this presentation. I also want to note that um, in the previous budgets, we've spent a lot of time talking about youth employment and right track, our flagship for, um, for employment in the city, employment programs and youth employment. Um, again, I wanna thank the council for their continued support. Um, we have ongoing commitments for that and we've had previous policy sessions that spoke about financing for right track and youth employment. So I'm gonna let that information stand with the prior materials. If there's something we haven't covered today or in prior sessions, we will come back and, and catch that later. Um, we're definitely committed to providing ongoing updates on those uh, successful right track plus um, uh, and other things you've heard about in prior briefings. Um, I do want to acknowledge looking at 2021, the Trust for Public Land again affirmed our ranking as one of the very top parks and rec systems in the country. Um, something that's made us additionally proud this year as they've ad added additional criteria that focuses on equity. So um, rewarding and acknowledging all the equity work St. Paul has done as a community and this council has supported. Um, we are um, number two of 100 top cities in the country. And um, it was kind of fun this week 
uh, a major city that's about our size out west. I think they're in Oregon. I think their name uh, starts with a P. Um, contacted us and wanted to know how we were doing it, how we have been in the top three for every year in the past uh, since we've been in the rankings. So we'll give them a little bit of information. We'll probably withhold the really good stuff to make sure um, our community maintains our top spot. <laughs> um, want to acknowledge that um, from uh, in August 2021 compared to last year, our aquatics facilities, our seasonal aquatic centers, and our rec centers are back online. We are operating. Um, we are wrapping up a successful summer season. Um, we uh, um, So it's great to wrap up summer. Last year, we were not in that position. Um, we've also tried some new things this year that expand our successful mobile programming and um, really have highlighted and focused on pursuing partnerships. Um, one highlight is with the um, the National Football League and the Minnesota Vikings to bring um, uh, tackle football and football to our youth um, participants free this year for everyone who's participating in our program. So wow. um, a brand new partnership this year, um, hopefully getting young people outside on those fields. Um, in 2021, we surpassed 2 million meals served through our family meals program. Um, 2 million is a remarkable figure. It's become a vital program for our youth and families community-wide. At Como Zoo and Conservatory, we've also reopened along with the rec centers and aquatic centers. And we've developed um, out of necessity online uh, reservation systems that have been successful. And we've, kind of, we've launched those at the same time that uh, we have credit card donations for the first time and um, we're seeing very positive results with both the online reservation and the donation systems. And uh, um, the, the, um, our visitors have responded terrifically um, to those systems and having donation options that are beyond cash. So modernizing those systems, a great uh, COVID uh, outlook or legacy um, contribution. And then uh, another thing to highlight on this slide is we've uh, delivered programming updates along the way, both to the council at policy sessions and in one-on-one -on -one sessions on our awakenings program and our uh, rec check programs as part of community first public safety. Um, we appreciate the feedback, um, the support for those programs as we work to um, integrate new public safety initiatives and strategies with our existing recreation programs and our um, terrific recreation staff. Um, uh, for both Rec Check and Awakenings, we did provide um, specific supplemental materials that are available in the budget packet. And I'm uh, looking at Mr. Meyer, I think those are um, also tagged to this meeting so the public has access to those as well. They, they should be. Um, moving on to slide three. Um, I want to highlight a, a couple things on our um, design and construction and operations side. Um, our um, splash pads and fountains are um, fully operational right now. We're concluding a successful season with those. And we also um, were able to uh, mobilize our seasonal maintenance for permits and special events. Um, uh, last year at this time, those things were uh, in either skeleton systems or shut down. Um, we have not been immune to staffing pressures that others are facing for temporary and seasonal work, um, but I, it's really a testament to our workforce, our supervisory structure, that we've been able to um, implement those services and um, provide services to the public that they expect in a very short period of time. For our design and construction services and most of our administrative support, we've been um, able to smoothly transition to a remote service delivery um, and virtual experience and uh, work to find ways to uh, that are new to engage with the public. I think a lot of those things have worked excellently and we will look to continue um, post pandemic, but um, we are definitely um, better in person and we look forward to resumption of in-person services now to supplement what we're able to do virtually. And uh, 
have a, a small list of projects that we can note um, where we had ribbon cuttings this year, Midway Peace Park in the center of the city, um, the Robert Pyram Regional Trail on the city's west side connecting to Dakota County, um, a partnership project with St. Paul uh, Urban Tennis uh, over on the east side at Eastview Rec Center and um, working to get the naming of our new parks, our new four new parks at Highland Bridge. Um, so we're, um, we're very proud of all of that work as we add uh, to the system and the customer experiences in 2021. Kind of wrapping up our highlights, uh, I, I do want to say while highlighting these projects, we've been very fortunate to have an engaged workforce and an engaged community throughout um, the pandemic in 2021 that understands the value of our services while also understands that we are making adaptations uh, both in terms of how we provide services and how the community receives services that focuses on keeping the community safe while also providing services. I'm gonna pause right there while we pivot to slide four in our org chart. Um, very, very quickly, uh, this is our organizational structure that um, puts the names of our um, senior leaders with each area that they directly are responsible for. Um, you'll note for each division business lines, and um, hopefully there's understanding of the, the vast difference and um, magnitude and reach of all of the various business lines and service lines that, uh, that we support in parks and recreation throughout the community and in working with our um, partner agencies with other city departments. Moving forward, um, slide five is a breakdown of our general fund budget, uh, which totals $41 million. It is a very large number. Um, uh, it is 60% of our operating budget. Um, and this graphic shows um, spending by percentage by division. It pig piggybacks on the previous org chart by isolating a few, num a few items as a percentage of the general fund budget. Um, you'll note uh, our budget continues to evolve as we advance additional investments in services such as community first public safety, um, recreation and forestry uh, with the EAB work uh, previously mentioned. Um, you'll also uh, note as a department, we have the most land and buildings to manage in the entire city. Um, well over 50%, 17% uh, of the city's land is parkland, and well over 50% of the city's buildings are um, managed by Parks and Recreation. And we invest a significant amount to manage, operate, and provide utilities for those buildings. Uh, slide six carries forward from the previous slide. Um, uh, this is spending breakdown. Um, within that general fund. A couple of key uh, takeaways as you dig into the details of this slide. Um, very lean budget and focused budget with almost 92% of our general fund spending uh, tied to staffing and direct overhead like utilities, and, uh, insurance and rent. So 92% of our general fund um, spending to repeat that is, is staff and facilities overhead. Um, that leaves the remaining 8% uh, of general fund contributions to be uh, dispersed for services and materials. Um, so we count on earned revenue to support the majority of those things, which you'll see in slide seven. Uh, this is an overview of our special funds, uh, which comprise the remaining 40% of our operating budget or 26 million. These are earned revenues from fees, um, grants, and partnerships. Um, this is the, the similar graphic that shows, um, I think is slide five, which shows the spending um, per um, managing division. Um, it, you'll note it's, it's somewhat converse and flipped, a huge chunk for Como Zoo and Conservatory with earned revenue. I'll note there that, uh, um, uh, 
7% inclusive of that 34% is grants that the Lewin Conservatory tracks down. So it's not all, um, all donations or commissions. Um, within the special services pie, 8.5% um, of our uh, special fund is revenue re we receive from operating the golf courses. And within that um, operations chunk of 24, um, over half of that is funding we get uh, through grants from the state of Minnesota for our regional park system and um, fees that are paid into our system to support abatement and contract services. So overall in this fund, the um, special fund, 52% uh, of that special fund is focused on the services and materials. So what that means is for the supplies and materials we need to um, provide classes or support the park system that we're, we're generally, generally relying on um, fees or grants to purchase those supplies and materials either to um, put uh, to buy the, the the seed we need for the golf courses or the craft supplies we need for rec center classes uh, or all the enrichment activities at the zoo and conservatory the all of those resources flow through this um, through this special fund um, before you move on I do see um, slide six and seven with general fund and special fund breakdown and one thing that um, Ms. Bernock did for us in the overall um, budget was merge the two um, really because it for me and it, it really could just be a me problem but I don't think so um, it's really hard to wrap my brains around you know why salaries have to come out of general fund and why you know operations are part here and part there and I think it would be interesting if if it's doable to have to just get a third graph that shows what these two things look like overlaid because it's a $67 million budget. And when you look at a portion of staff um, as part of the full budget, as opposed to just the general fund budget, I think it changes the picture a little bit or the zoo or what have you. So I just would like to make that request if we could get that same thing. And I, as I said, I think we saw um, that long, long desired graphic um, in the city general overall budget from Ms. Bernock. So I, it's, it's out there. Um, but that would be really helpful for me because I think it, I, this is always very interesting, um, but just the merging helps me get a bigger picture of the whole budget. Um, and so that's a request and Ms. Naker has a hand up. Thanks, Council President. Director Hum, how aggressively are we pursuing grants? Um, do we have staff allocated to that purpose? Do you have a sense of how much ballpark we pull down from the national and state and other levels? And then I'm, I'm also wondering if being the number two park system in the country helps or hurts us in those in those philanthropic quests? Um, thank you for the question. First, uh, Council President Brenmon, um, I'm Brad Meyer is nodding at me. We should be able to turn around that graphic um, probably before your next um, budget meeting. So you can expect that. Um, and thank you, Councilmember Naker for your question. Um, we, we are very aggressive and strategic at pursuing um, uh, grants and partnerships. Uh, the NFL um, grant and partnership that I referenced earlier was an example of that. Um, I, I kind of separate those out into two categories. The first are our program grants that we are specifically eligible for, um, like working with um, our relationship with the state of Minnesota for right track is an example that we're very aggressive and intentional of dedicating staff time to chase um, to promote our local needs and to chase down those partnerships. Um, we also do um, target very specific um, uh, foundation support and, and things that are less systemic to, to chase those grants. Um, for the most part, we don't have, uh, we don't have a dedicated grant writer um, or um, development position that pursues those things. It's, it's more, uh, your professional staff in each operating division that have to carve out time to do that. Um, so whether it's design and construction, um, Mr. Rodriguez's team and recreation or Ms. Odegaard's team for special services that are chasing um, those grants. Um, uh, it is something uh, in uh, combination with 
what um, you might receive from OFS that we can report out on of what our current levels are and, um, and maybe show a, a three to five year window or um, graphic of how we've been doing there. Um, it's, I would say we're, um, we're very strategic about what we apply for, um, uh, only going after those things that are a high level of success. I think for both the public pursuit and private philanthropy, it helps our standing is um, that we do a good job, helps us in our pursuits. Um, all of our funding partners wanna be successful and um, we're able to demonstrate success in our reports out. Um, uh, just because success, we're successful doesn't mean we don't have need. And our staff are very, um, very skilled at identifying where need is, how it relates to the city's goals, for instance, around equity, and how the funding partnership can help us meet those needs. Are there other questions? And thanks for that. I think, um, Ms. Naker, the question too um, kind of overlaps into the conversation about ARP and you know, sometimes having the dedicated resources to get money ultimately pays for itself and then some. So um, I think that we should remember to ask that question, question with other departments as well. I'm gonna count on you for that. All right, uh, doesn't look like there's other questions, so we can move on, thank you. Um, thank you, Council President Brenmullen. And um, it, uh, moving toward the um, budget objectives. It goes without saying that our, our main priorities are safe and equitable services. Um, access to programs and services uh, continues to play a pivotal role now and more than ever for mental and physical health. Um, our 2022 budget assumes return to in-person and standard operations at um, rec centers and aquatic facilities. So the, the budget uh, as it's being proposed fully funds what our pre uh, um, what our normal was for in-person services. Um, public realm and direct services have never been more important. Our community first public safety um, efforts, specifically awakenings have also been um, more important as inequities and trauma have been illuminated through um, pan the pandemic civil unrest um, related to the murder of George Floyd and economic uncertainties related to all of the above. Um, I do want to tie back to the previous question about um, grant pursuit and partnerships. We are, we are increasingly um, working um, directly and intentionally with our partners. Um, the Downtown Alliance, our great partner at Como Zoo and Conservatory, Como Friends, um, the St. Paul Parks Conservancy, um, our Great River Passage Conservancy. And um, that would be something in one-on-ones to, to come back and talk to council members about perhaps how we're working with those nonprofits to leverage um, those grant support as well. Not all of the grant support runs through the city's budget. A lot of it runs through um, those partnerships and opportunities with our nonprofit partners. Um, slide nine is an overview of our uh, general fund breakdown and highlights significant general fund changes from previous budgets. Um, on this graphic, you'll note it, the past investments um, for awakenings as we open Frogtown Community Center and the new habitat at Como Harbor. You'll also um, note the large reduction and services and FTEs that were made to this year's budget for um, recreation, aquatics, and um, operations. So this is a look back to the last um, two prior general fund budgets. Ms. Naker. Thanks, Council President. Director Hum, I noticed uh, the 2020 line about the credit card donations at Como and the expected revenue increase. I know it's been a weird year and a half, but I'm wondering if we have any even preliminary data on the revenue that we've seen from credit card donations over and above what we were seeing when we didn't have that option. And then if we are seeing revenue increase, how that is being deployed in the budget. 
Um, Council President Brenmo and Council Member Naker, I, I think that's a, a question that would be um, easiest to follow up with with some specific data points that we can have the um, Michelle and the Como staff report out on. Um, overall, our attendance, um, because of the limitations of the pandemic, have been down at Como. So our, our earned revenue has been down. Our per capita revenue has been up. So our per capita donations, the nonprofits uh, gift shop and our concessions per capita has been up. So it's, um, uh, I would say uh, there's some really good information we can mine from that and report back, um, but probably too early to conclude anything long-term until we can get our overall like level of activity back up to prior and know if we're, we're hitting those budget numbers, but be happy to report back on that. Uh, probably within a couple of weeks, we should be able to provide that information. I, I'm assuming too, that there's, there's gonna be, I mean, I just even just like the opportunity to finally get out and do something <laughs> could make me feel more generous with my you know, charitable contribution. So it will be interesting to see if it levels out or if it's just the ease is so, um, you know, such a incentive for people that it continues to to increase. But I'm I'm really glad that we're moving in this direction, especially with the ability now to just like tap your card. It's just so easy to do. So um, I'll be interested in tracking that over time as well. Thank you. We will, uh, Council President Fremont and Council Member Naker, we'll be happy to report that back. What I can say definitively is um, what it was not on that sheet is our visitors really like the advance reservation and donation option. And that was not something that was part of the mix before. So it uh, will be something you know fun to consider moving forward and as we report. Um, slide 10 talks about the, the major changes in our 2022 uh, general fund budget. Um, the, the big number on the top uh, starts with the FTE restorations um, and that's thanks to the a ARPA funding. Um, we'll have a little bit greater breakdown of that on the next slide. Um, we're already, um, so within that, that restores all of the FTE reductions that were taken in this year's budget, in the 2021 budget. And that number is also inclusive of the funding that the council placed in contingency um, in this year's budget that it re recent re recently released. So that is all, all of the funding back, including uh, inclusive of the contingency funds. Um, so with the fund, with the release of the contingency, we're already mobilizing the return of hours at rec centers um, uh, and expanded hours at aquatics facilities. Um, this budget allows those things to be carried forward in 2022. Um, we will look forward to getting the remaining FTEs back in our workforce to support services that will be hopefully returning to full strength as we get into 2022. Um, the slide 11 goes into a little bit greater detail. Can you go back? I forgot about Ford and um, um, thank you. Uh, the other two line items are, are very important. The first one, we are forecasting um, the new parks coming on at Highland Bridge, four new parks, multiple acres uh, and trails. This provides staffing um, uh, and the uh, supplies to operate those new systems at the site. Um, having a, additional FTEs will create a little bit of um, capacity. We'll have more people power and there will be some, uh, some benefits that cascade a little bit out from the Highland Bridge site. Um, as we get into the operating reality of that, we look forward to implementing that, bringing the new parks and services online and reporting back out on that. Um, we, we also are a participant um, and, and fully on board with uh, the HVAC and air quality improvements that have been made to all of our buildings. And this um, indicates what our share of those operating costs are for those items. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Dinker. Thanks, Council President. Director Hum, um, I heard you say that the staff being restored is from American Rescue Plan dollars. Can you talk about what else is from ARP? I'm looking at HVAC. It seems like that would definitely be an ARP eligible expense. Is there anything else? 
Is that or anything else being ARP funded? Uh, I'm going to look to um, Mr. McCarthy or the OFS staff uh, who may be able to provide a better response to that than I can. I'll go ahead and answer it. Uh, this is Tara Baranach. Um, I'm the only the restoration is funded by ARP um, because the HVAC improvements are an ongoing thing that we expect to um, uh, to continue into the future. It is was included in the general fund balancing. And as a follow up question, I. I assume that we are also planning to continue the 24.9 FTEs into the future. So I'm wondering what the plan is for getting those back onto the general fund and why that was an ARP choice. Council President, Council Member Naker, we are in the process of pulling together the plan to show how um, the, uh, the, the positions, the restorations would step off of the ARP funding. Um, we anticipate that that plan would include um, some continued ARP funding in the next two years at a lower level, as well as um, property tax, potential property tax increases and, um, and or uh, uh, service reductions, departmental budget cuts, and as well as revenue um, recovery after the pandemic. Um, we uh, have, we were a challenge to get through the process with the major uh, choices that we had and to be able to do that plan we and have it be uh, thoughtful. It's been, we've delayed it. Thanks, Ms. Baranak. I appreciate that. And I'll really look forward to seeing that. I think um, I understand the, the need for bridge funding for ARP dollars. And at the same time, it's concerning to see these, some of these critical services and parks and libraries being put on ARP um, not in the general fund. So I, I know we're all aligned about the need to eventually fund those through general fund, but it would be helpful to see how that step back works. You're muted, Mr. Hom. Um, thank you, Council President. I was um, I was trying to get a uh, comment into Brad and I learned that, um, that Ms. Houston is running the PowerPoint now, so. I, uh, I'm going to ask her to advance it to slide 11. If that's Be okay. Before you move, I'm sorry. I just, right. um, I, I, um, I thought you were uh, following up on the question from Ms. Naker and Ms. Bernock's response, but I, I just also wanted to um, say that I appreciate the, the, like the clear articulation of the increased operating and staffing that's required when we add additional um, park land. Um, in this case, it's um, Highland Bridge, which is a huge, huge, um, you know, four parks. But I'm also, I will be looking for similar operating and staffing um, acknowledgement when we talk about our fire budget, our police budget, our public works budget. I mean, these additions are going to increase, um, you know, the load on our city departments. And so... Um, I think it's great, but I also appreciate the acknowledgement of the costs that are associated with that. And I just, um, I just want to make sure that we're also anticipating that we, this council has talked a lot about maintenance and, um, you know, when we add things, they also have even, a, even a capital investment will have a maintenance tail. And so recognizing that all of the things that we're adding will have ongoing expenses. And if we don't take care of our, um, assets, the cost for maintaining them increases over time. And so I just, I think it's important to, um, you know, celebrate the things that we're adding, but also um, recognize that there's a cost associated with it. And we will see increased revenue in, in some of these areas, particularly um, Ford and Highland Bridge, but also recognizing the cost of um, staffing and also maintaining those facilities, I think is, is important for us to keep on our radar. More of a comment, I think, than a question, but just want to make sure that um, I do appreciate the call out and um, we'll be looking for that in other departments as well. Thanks. Um, thank you, Council President. Um, it, I was looking forward to um, slide 11. It gets, it really gets to your comment, Council President, and the question from Councilmember Naker about uh, some of the detail and 
um, what where the FTEs are. Um, I, I will say for um, for all of the items that are here, uh, fun, bringing these on in 2022 through a, ARPA restores the FTA, uh, restores the FTE reductions. A lot of um, a lot of acronyms there that were reduced due to COVID. Um, it brings um, 25 FTEs back to the system, and the importance to us of bringing the FTEs back, it allows um, Ms. Odegaard, Mr. Hagel, Mr. Rodriguez to go hire um, employees and start that process and start the season with the understanding we're bringing employees back on. So I think that is critical. Um, our, um, our leaders have listened to um, uh, Mayor Carter's call and this council's call to um, use the adjustments that we've made um, from COVID to to also have learnings about um, what um, what we could do differently operating. I think um, as we go through um, this season of the rec center operations, the adjustments that we've made for aquatics, that we've we've had some learnings um, part of the service shifts that we've had through COVID, and I I really do appreciate uh, the feedback that our leaders have received from this council when they've asked about um, what we could do with um, aquatic schedules, rec hours, um, service adjustments. So as we add things back, we'll be looking for the same type of inputs. Um, what, uh, what, what these investments allow us to do is enter 2022, knowing we have resources and staffing available to restore those services. I don't think it's our plan to do things identically we want to apply uh, those COVID learnings, but we um, we want to uh, expand and restore those services. Um. Ms. Nanker. Thanks, Council President. And Director Hum, I'm, I'm so grateful that we, that your department is prioritizing returning those services and those FTEs. I, I know all of us, the cuts last year were painful and we've talked a lot about how in this budget, we wanna look at what's coming back and make sure that we're getting back to, to where we were or beyond. So I appreciate that. It would be really helpful to know um, that whatever changes you you just referenced exactly what might look different and to what extent we're back where we were in 2020 versus something else happening. Um, and it would also, I, I would appreciate knowing, and this is sort of across the board, rec center hours, programming in general. I know cuts have been made before 2020 in 2019 and 18 and before that. And it would be helpful to better understand where we're at in terms of hours and programming compared to maybe 2019 or 18, just to see um, what the trend has been over time in terms of our programming and services. And that's a follow-up, but just to keep, it's kind of hard to keep the big picture in mind when every year we just talk about the changes from last year. And I think constituents are seeing the changes over numbers of years. Um. Thank you, Council President, Council Member Naker. Um, uh, it, at the macro level, one of the adjustments we made last year is all the all of our rec centers pretty much have the same basic operating hours um, ac across the system right now, which is a change for a system that is uh, really program dependent. I'm gonna ask um, Mr. Meyer to summarize what we have right now and what information we can give, give you um, on short order versus some things that may take a little bit more time uh, to, to provide to the council. Uh, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Council President Brent Mullen. Uh, council Member Naker, so we, um, we did put together kind of a breakdown uh, for the, the use of ARPA funds for 2021 um, and how we're restoring services and, and where that kind of lands in both recreation and aquatics for you that we can share um, right away. And it embedded in there is how that will translate into 2022 uh, for both aquatics as well as uh, recreation. And, and Andy Rodriguez and Susie Odegaard and their teams have done a really good job of starting to mobilize planning for um, what the restoration will look like programmatically. Um, and at a minimum, the hours restoration within recreation um, will be restored. And then Greater Water Park, uh, the summer hours will, will be added back. And then within their programming model, we'll also um, start to dig into kind of uh, the rem what what the service model will look like and where the hours will land um, because there there is some nuance there but um, we can share the breakdown for 2021 right after this meeting and then we can kind of dig into the rest um, as as those plans flesh out over the next um, 
weeks and, and months. All right, I think we can move on to slide 12. Um, uh, and to the previous question, this slide breaks down in a little bit greater detail the operating uh, needs and what is funding for the Highland Bridge site and the, the, uh, the new acreage and park space that is there. Um, uh, much like when we uh, opened the Frogtown Community Center or looking forward to the North End Community Center, for uh, an addition this large to the system, we, we could not bring it on without having uh, substantial um, operating support, including staffing. This represents that and uh, uh, ensures that both we can bring these new services into the community and into the system without taking away from services that are currently be being provided someplace else. And um, I would again offer that while it's very difficult to define, there is also some economies of scale and some assistance that the, the rest of the system will get um, when we are adding uh, three FTEs into our overall workforce. So this is, um, this is a needed and an investment that we are very grateful for as we expand our system and services uh, that will benefit the entire um, entire system. Uh, slide 13 uh, talks about deferred maintenance. Um, we will be back, um, Parks and Recreation will be back in November to talk capital improvement budgets as part of the, the larger discussion at that time, but it wouldn't be a proper Parks and Recreation budget presentation without a few slides on deferred maintenance. I do wanna pause here and reference um, uh, the council did ask for some reflection on um, c the capital improvement budget as part of this initial conversation. Um, the, um, the new financing strategy for major capital is fully funding the North End Community Center as part of this um, budget, and we are fully supportive and grateful for that. We are continuing to pursue um, grants and funding partnerships that would uh, reduce the city's obligation for that project, but our um, Parks and Recreation's number one capital priority is funded in this budget because of that addition and change. So uh, that is definitely worth noting. Um, on this slide, we will uh, note investment in our annual programs over the last couple years and um, how it's, uh, how it's moved around and it translates to um, incremental increases to our facility condition index, which you're gonna see on the next page and our deferred maintenance backlog. Um, uh, we've, I, as we look at the uh, slide on, uh, the information on slide 14, um, you'll see that play out in this graphic that you've should be familiar with after seeing the last five years or so. Um, we've forecasted a really uh, large unfunded liability. I think the investments in the annual programs and deferred maintenance has slowed that climb, but we're, um, we, we are still increasing. We still have uh, work to do here and we still have a, um, a gap where we're not um, optimizing the service life of our um, assets and to um, have those assets in a condition that the public can enjoy them. We have a, a significant amount of investment, especially as we get out into uh, years five, 10, 15 years from now. Um, Ms. Ninker. Thanks, Council President. And Director Hum, I really appreciate that you included this slide. Um, these slides as part of the presentation. And I'm I'm very, very concerned about the deferred maintenance. And it seems like all of the indicators budget-wise are going in the wrong direction when it comes to taking care of this. It looks like from your previous slide, CIB annual maintenance is going down. Um, it looked like when we saw the presentation from the mayor's office last week, the 640,000 per year from CIB was budgeted in 22, but then not budgeted for the rest 23 and on. Um, 
and then I, you know, the mayor hasn't proposed, I don't believe any ARP funding to be used for any kind of deferred maintenance, um, which to me seems like the perfect use of, of one-time dollars to the extent that it's eligible under ARP. So I, I guess I'm just wondering from your perspective, is this a problem? How do, wh what, what do we need to do or what are we doing that we're moving in the right direction? Um, Council President Brenmon, Council Member Naker, I, uh, it, it would be disingenuous to look at this chart and not say we're forecasting obligations or a problem moving forward. Um, I, I will say for the, the present, and it would always be great to have more resources. Um, I will say within this budget and the recent budgets, we have slowed the growth um, from where we would be if we invested um, nothing on top of uh, nothing in addition to what we had done. So we are doing that. I will also say that um, while there's no specific investment targeted yet, that the, the mayor's budget and initiatives around jobs and infrastructure does give a, a really large lane where we can work to um, have jobs programs that also can benefit the deferred maintenance schedule. Um, Director Kershaw, uh, Public Works Director Sean Kershaw and I are, are talking with our staff and our youth employment staff about how we can potentially access proposed programs and access those resources for painting programs, for potentially paving programs, and, um, and uh, programs around land, landscape apprenticeships, which would um, maintain our green infrastructure. So um, while there's from my perspective, while there's nothing specifically identified um, right right now on top of the annual programs we've identified, there is a really strong opportunity for those proposals to be heard and funded. And if, if we can be successful to put together um, a apprentice painting program if, or a, um, an apprentice mace, mason program, working with our partners in the trades those things would would get to jobs, but would also get to this deferred maintenance backlog. So um, I'm uh, I'm hopeful that we can come back as part of those discussions to give those um, ideas their fair shake, and we'll see how they um, how they balance out with the other needs that are out there in the community. I appreciate that, Mr. Hahn, but is the um... Deferred maintenance, is the bulk of it painting and masonry or is it like just building condition roofs? And I mean, it's it doesn't seem like it's nibbling around the edges problems. It's like. Um, Council President Brenmo and Council Member Naker, that's a that's a fair question. It's um, uh, on this chart, it's it's everything um, at like the our asphalt conditions would be a, a very large chunk of it. Um, painting is very visible, but probably not a large financial gap. But um, uh, from my perspective, as a major property manager, if 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 we don't tuck point and paint our buildings, we um, the the larger expensive things that follow come up too. So I, I think it all contributes. Um, I I really look forward right. to a robust I, discussion I, around those things. Right, and it sounds to me, I I what I heard is that. You know, acknowledgement and also that looking to ARP, the ARP discussion, as we as we allocate those resources, could be this opportunity that when we talk, I know the council's recent um, ARP memo pointed to infrastructure as a priority, and this is a great example of that. Um, you know, because we, I mean, just when you speak of asphalt, I know just last week, I uh, a section in Ward Four. Um, between Lexington and Hamlin was at long last completed and the, the asphalt was like literally dangerous before it was completed. And what I've noticed is since um, it looks like it's still closed, but doesn't seem like anyone quite cares. <laughs> they just want to be on that um, refinished smooth surface on the rollerblades, on the roller skis, on their bikes with their little kids. And, um, you know, when we wait 50 years to get back to our asphalt, it is too long. Um, especially without maintenance and the in between, and that's just one small piece of this. So I will second that. Um, you know, what the hope that we can find um, ARP dollars to help buy down this um, deferred maintenance um, 
backlog with some one-time expenditures because it's, I mean, 15 years from now it looks bleak. And um, we've we've talked about it. I know no one here disagrees with that, but just um, recognizing that as part of the general fund, maybe perhaps it's uh, just a good reminder that this uh, something meaningful could come out of the ARP funds. Thank you. Thank you, Council President and Council Member Naker. We appreciate the, count, the Council's understanding of, of our de deferred maintenance obligations and um, the, the value of taking care of what we have and extending the service life. Because um, uh, if, if we can make those choices to invest in maintenance, it's, uh, it's cheaper than replacement. So, um, but we, look, we do look forward to that discussion. Um, I am trying to see if there's anything we missed on this backlog. Um, and I don't think so. Um, I, as we, uh, kind of a, a last point, I know uh, Holly's queuing off my, <laughs> my saying we're done. Um, I, there's also a citywide effort that we are a major participant in to look at um, asset management and fund funding uh, strategies. Uh, so we are an active participant in that to see if there's ways we can mon modernize our overall approach as an enterprise and as a city to um, take care of our assets. So we're, we're all into that discussion. Um, but obviously the, uh, the importance of those CIB maintenance streams um, and uh, those incremental decisions, especially how we can spend the one-time money for AARP uh, to um, fund those critical needs is important. Um, I'll, I'll conclude um, by saying, looking at, uh, b before we move into questions, as we look at these, the, the three budgets most recently, the mid-year adjustments we made in 2020 uh, during COVID um, are, uh, we were shutting down buildings, we were suspending services, and Parks and Recreation was in a great position to return general fund flexibility uh, to the budgets and, and flexibility to uh, taxpayers. Um, this year, um, we spent the majority of the year um, adding back services and um, started adding them back in the summer. Um, so we, we had a, still have a good deal of budget flexibility and we're, we're um, in a position now heading into the fall that we are um, with the council action to release the contingency funds to um, uh, work to add back those services. And this budget for 2022 um, uh, puts us in a position as we roll into next year to um, enter the 2022 season with the um, budget authority to, um, to hire staff, to spend money and to provide services to um, restore uh, the general portfolio of all of the adjustments that have been made the last two years up to this point. So I, I think that is a, a great opportunity in that regard. This is an excellent budget for parks and recreation. And we look, you know, we look forward to the discussion for how we can do that, um, work with the community, work with this council and, um, apply the learnings we've had through COVID to um, continue to imp improve our system and deliver services. So I appreciate the time. We will be back in November for CIB and um, uh, we can stand for any questions. Great, uh, Mr. Tolbert. Yeah, Mr. Ham, I, um... This is more of a comment than a question, but I, I just want to thank you for the um, for the budget and the, and the good outlook. I know many of my constituents will be very happy with the restoration of ours and in the rec centers as well as the pool. Um, I know you guys made some tough choices last year, and a lot of it was on the fly as as circumstances changed. And you guys continue to adapt and and provide services. And I continue to say I haven't seen our parks use more than they have been over the last year and a half, two years. And um, if, if we were lucky to have the second or third ranking, but I think just the, the use of it shows how much we need to continue to invest in our parks. It's, it's great to see parking lots full, trails full, 
um, rec centers full, hockey rinks full, um, water aerobics classes full. Um, so thank you guys for the heroic work that you guys have done over the last year and a half of continuing to adapt, but still providing the services and the space for people to let out um, anxiety, stress, whatever it needs to be, and just get some outdoor time. Um, so thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Talbert. Um, I have Ms. Naker and then Ms. Yang. Thanks, Council President. And I'd like to, to echo Councilmember Talbert's thanks, Director Hom. Um, I also really appreciate how you have, uh, how you responded to our questions, got us all all that we asked for in advance, and uh, um, you know the concise nature of this PowerPoint presentation that covers everything but still gives us time for discussion is really helpful. So thank you for doing that. Um, two very very specific questions. I'm just always trying to think about how this big picture budget actually relates to what we see on the ground in the city. Um, and to that point, two questions. One. Um, I am concerned about that decrease in annual maintenance funding in CIB that you mentioned, and I assume that that I, I'm not sure why the decision was made to cut $700,000 from that budget, but I'm wondering if you can talk about about the reasoning for that to the extent that you know it and the impact that you think that will have. I'm always hearing from constituents about um, a particular area of a park that needs maintenance, that needs repair, that needs you know some extra bricks being replaced, et cetera. So I'm, I'm very sensitive to any pr proposed decreases in that, especially knowing how much construction costs have gone up. Um, so that's one question. And then secondly, um, I, please remind me and correct me if I'm mistaken about graffiti and whether or not that is a park's responsibility or not. Um, if it is, I'm, I'm just curious. I know lately there have been a number of um, pretty obscene uh, instance of graffiti, at least in my ward, that have taken quite a while to, to remove. Um, obviously, they really affect quality of life when those are allowed to remain. And I'm just wondering if, I know the shortage and the backlog of getting those cleared up, I'm just curious if that's a bug or a feature of the system, and if it's a feature, um, if there's any budget changes we need to make to be able to address that more quickly. Uh, Council President Brenmon, Council Member Naker, starting with the second question on the graffiti. Um, the, the parks the parks and recreation um, trades crew is the city's abatement crew. We have a, um, a dedicated group of, uh, I think it's two painters that respond to the, the graffiti on, on public and private property. Um, I'm not aware if we have a, a staff shortage or a work order shortage there right now, but what I, what I can do is follow up uh, within the week to find out what the what the backlog is and if we have um, any shortages there, for um, for painting, we're usually able to uh, if we have staff turn, turnover access the the union hall pretty rapidly to um, uh, to replenish our our staffing complement. But I can uh, let me uh, report on that um, because if if, if uh, like you, when I see it with my eyes, I really evaluate if we're if we're caught up or not, or if it's stuff that's out there that's not being reported. Um, but uh, I can report on that. Um, and in this case, I know it was reported from my own cell phone, so okay. I can attest to that. <laughs> Before you move on, though, just can on that process though, it gets reported through the DSI. Um, Council President Brenmo and Council members, prim the primary intake for that is through DSI. Um, if um, for instance, from time to time, one of you will shoot me a note that says there's graffiti someplace. Our staff enter that into the same system as the DSI staff. Okay, and I realize that you have a second question you're following up on, but I do just, I think that we have, it's been drawn to our attention that there's a, a giant backload at DSI and it could have, you know, this could be connected to that. So I, if when you do your follow up, if that's a piece of it, we definitely would like to know before we meet with DSI because it, it seems like there's a lot of um, bottlenecking in the intake at DSI. Um, I will uh, I will follow up on that. Like I said, we should be able to provide that pretty rapidly. Um, uh, um, to the to the question on the annual maintenance, it's like I I I hear um, Parks and Recreation hears you and. Um, I, I don't know if, if the OFS staff that staff the CIB committee can provide any additional information. I, I will say from, from my perspective as the Parks and Recreation Director, um, uh, the changes to CIB 
and fully funding our number one capital project are are good. And when we are successful in tracking down um, some of the grant pursuits that we are for the community center project, um, uh, that, that should allow more flexibility within the capital budget. And I know we will be advocating for that to be going into our other priorities, but it's, um, it's it's difficult because there is a finite resource there, and um, uh, I we can only spend it in one place. In this case, it's being allocated to the capital project, and as we get flexibility in the capital project, I'm hopeful that we can free up some additional funds. But I will uh, um, I will I see Mr. McCarthy's on. I'll ask him for some help on the capital budget side of things. Uh, Council President Brenmo and Council Member Naker, it's a good question. And Director Hom, I think you you hit the nail on the head on a lot of the key pieces there. We do most of our maintenance and our big projects out of the same uh, limited CIB budget um, of $11 million a year. We have kind of three big projects that have been uh, coming through that pipeline over a number of years trying to get funding. Uh, this year, uh, we were able to take advantage of the record low interest rates to advance all three of those big projects, which clears them out um, and allows you know future opportunities to then um, not have those three big projects eating up the whole uh, annual budget. So we were able to fund this cycle, the North End Community Center, Fire Station 7, and the Hamlin Midway Library. Um, as Director Hom noted, we're aggressively pursuing outside sources for the community center as well as the fire station. Um, should any of those come through, and we're optimistic that, uh, that they would, um, it just frees up additional CIB resources for other needs like deferred maintenance. And I think we've all heard loud and clear and, and finance and parks have both been uh, pushing that message for for the last several years that we need to be investing more in, in maintenance. And so, um, you know, as we were able to free up our own sources with outside money, then that's a great opportunity to be able to sink more money into maintenance. Um, and again, I think, you know, the long term strategy here of taking advantage of those low interest rates to um, to to go after these three big projects and get them off of the list um, helps us longer term to to be able to be more strategic with maintenance. Thanks, Mr. McCarthy. Just a quick follow up, Council President. I, I completely agree with the idea. It makes much more financial sense to take advantage of low interest rates when we can. I didn't realize that was coming at the cost of maintenance of what we already have. And so that's why the, the question is coming up. And I, I we frequently get critiqued for building new things and not taking care of what we already have in place. And so I just, I wanna flag when that looks like it is actually what is happening. And I appreciate the point about hopefully grants can come and backfill that, but um, I, I do wanna recognize that that seems like it's what's being reflected in the budget right now. And I suppose the alternative is having millions of dollars sitting in a savings account until we get enough to do a project. So I, 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 when we dig in on CIB, I too will be interested in hearing uh, the pros and cons, and then um, also hoping to find um, our federal funding miracle on, on some of the projects so we can open up um, those dollars for some of these much needed um, infrastructure and maintenance. Um, Ms. Yang. Thank you. I wanted to say thanks to Director Hom and to the staff for the budget presentation. It was really helpful to see um, we're we're sitting long term and and uh, I wanted to reaffirm my support for using our ARP dollars toward Parks and Rec. And so I just want to urge you all to continue sharing with us, um, especially since uh, you're working directly with staff who are doing the groundwork in our city and know, um, you know, what type of barriers are out there as well and what they need in order to be able to do their job well. Um, welcome you to uh, just keep sharing with us that uh, kind of information as we make decisions around how we will use up the ARP budget as well. Thank you, Council Member Yang. Um, and I just have a just one thought here. It looks like where people are um, just on, on other hands up. I think Ms. Yang still has a hand up, but it's not not new. OK, just checking. Um, and this is maybe more like a fly on the wall type of observation, but it, it seems like um, over time, people's recreational desires change. Um, 15 years ago, I never heard of pickleball, and now I hear pickleball once a week. Um, you know, everyone was rollerblading for a while, then not so much, and, and it does feel like things change. And I'm, I really hope that as we're we're creating new infrastructure, particularly things like um, North End Community Center, I know we've really thought about 
um, flexibility and how as things change, we can continue to use the facility and as we go forward, even if desires change. I know, you know, just one example is like we, I know their spot is out there working hard to get people interested in tennis, but there are less people playing tennis today than 25 years ago. And how can we adapt those courts to play pickleball or how can we use them for other um, activities? But just always keep in mind, I think about like home designing homes uh, that are ADA accessible, um, but that don't feel like they're just uh, an ADA home, you know, so something that has that flexibility so that you can live in a home, but then if you become um, less um, able to, or your mobility is less and that you can still stay in that place. And so I just, I'm hoping that we're applying those, that sort of uh, flexible uh, design and architecture as we're moving forward. Cause it's some, I feel like some of our older buildings um, are kind of become an albatross because they're they're there and they're hard to let go of a community asset, but sometimes they no longer really serve our community in the way they were intended. Um, one example that's just been on my mind lately is, um, you know, we've we've created some vault bathrooms, some fancy bathrooms around the city that um, routinely are like horribly vandalized, um, costly to repair, closed down while we repair. Um, sometimes people are, um, you know building fires and them staying in them throwing things down into the toilet and ruining them and um you know this year with covid or over last year we used a lot more porta potties and so we were able to have them in more locations they're not as nice and fancy but on the other hand they provide bathrooms in spaces i know there were some parks um, when my kids were little but i was like i would do anything for a bathroom here um and now there are porta potties so like do we want to keep building big fancy well, bathrooms are maybe porta potties in the season where people are using the parks the most good enough. Um, and maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but I'm, I'm hoping that we're having those conversations because I feel like um, we like lessons learned from COVID and lessons learned from our past projects are hopefully adding up to um, um, future projects that are more sustainable and flexible in, in nature. Um, okay, so I'm looking to see if there's other questions. All right. Um, okay. Well, it looks like we are at that, as Ms. Nanker was saying, this is succinct and gave us a time to answer uh, questions here at the end is great. And we'll expect some follow up, I know, along the way. Um, but, um, and then I think determine if we need to come back or not. So thank you, um, Mr. Hom, your team. Uh, for this presentation and, and echoing my colleagues, just thank you uh, for your adaptability, your flexibility, your creativity. Um, I, I'm sorry, I would be remiss if I didn't also say um, probably one of the most compelling meetings I've had in the past three months was a meeting with Gwen Peterson um, and her Awakenings team. And I know that that project has been something um, that was challenging to launch in COVID. Um, but we met with her extraordinary team who talked about the work that they're doing um, with eight to 13 year olds. And it was just an incredible conversation. And I feel so fortunate that we have a team of you. Uh oh, it seems like you're frozen, Council President. Hate when that happens when you're on a roll in the closing. I don't want to close this out. Yeah, that's that's got to quit. There we go. She's it's driving me not. Um, okay. But just, just I just wanted to say that the it was it was wonderful to hear from them and and understand better what's going on with Awakenings now that it's had some chance to um, mature and. I'm really looking forward to going to one of the graduation ceremonies tomorrow um, at McDonough, but I just, I really appreciate the time. I know um, when you're a youth outreach worker, the probably the last thing you wanna do is sit on a Zoom call with a council member, <laughs> wanna get in and do the real work, but it was really meaningful to um, Jessica and I to have that conversation. And, and so I just wanna give that a special shout out as well. Um, so, oh, Mr. Tolbert has a hand up. Yeah, th thank you. And I just want to go back to actually the point that you made before about the dual uses and the adaptation and the changing. I, I think it's an important um, thing to weigh in on and just, you know, give parks some guidance or coverage on it. I, I couldn't agree more with you about continuing to adapt. I think, you know, one thing that COVID has taught us is that we can 
adapt and we can continue to try new things and change them. If they don't work, we can change them back in some cases, not always, but um, I think you're exactly right. And I think investing in uh, multi-use facilities, multi-use fields, parks are so important. I think the perfect example is, you know, when, when I was growing up, there was no lacrosse to play. Now it's a huge thing, particularly in, in the area I represent. Uh, there was no um, ultimate Frisbee teams, and now that's about as, as big as it gets. Um, you know, I, I wish they had those sports. They looked fun when I when I was back, <laughs> more athletic back and younger. Um, but I think continuing to have multi-use fields that can adapt to the, the games that young people are playing. I mean, you know, I know football has adapted, and now it's mostly flag football um, because, because of the serious concussion issues that um, regular football has. Um, but... I just I say this more not as a specific request or anything, but to give parks and your leadership team, um, I, I don't know, coverage or um, um, support to continue to adapt to what and reassess, especially in a city with limited um, park space and limited res you know, um, space to continue to adapt to the the grow to the changing needs of of the people we serve. So, uh, just echoing that and um, passing on. I think about that too with turf fields. They're they're the best, and they really extend the life of a field. But they also um, limit use in some ways uh, from a more from more informal. Um, so making sure that we have a balance of those things. It's I know that's what we have a parks department for. But <laughs> this is um, thoughts from you know the perch over here, and I appreciate your willingness to to hear us out as we, um, you know in our deep in our communities here these this sort of reflection so thanks for that um thank you once again for your work for your team's effort getting this budget presentation to us we look forward to your follow-up um and conversations around arp funding as well in the months ahead of us so thank you um we appreciate you thank you very much look forward to coming back great um before we adjourn i am going to bop over to miss houston to get a kind of an overview of where we where we are and where we're headed. Thank you, Council President, and good morning, Council Members. Um, so this was the first department meeting that we heard today from Parks and Recreation. We have a busy schedule in the next couple of weeks coming up um, to hear from those larger general fund departments. So next week, we'll be hearing from the Police Department at our 10 a.m budget committee meeting. And then at the library board meeting, libraries will focus on their general fund and ARP budget changes at 2 p.m. The following week on September 8th, we'll hear from fire and public works at the budget committee meeting. And then at 2 p.m. we'll be hearing the HRA PED budget at two, yeah, I said 2 p.m. Um, and that's all in preparation for September 15th, where the levy limit vote will be held at the 3.30 city council meeting. Um, and before that levy limit vote um, is held, we will hear from DSI to round out the, the top, is it five? Well, six, six departments. So um, I continue, I will be working on um, the budget survey that we had last year and we'll get out a draft to you this week for your review and try to get that online September 1st through the rest of the budget season. Is there any other Great. questions on the process at this point? It does not look like it. Just a reminder to my colleagues that mm, the mayor has proposed a 6.9% levy increase and I think historically, um, whatever the council said as a levy limit is where we ended up with a levy until about three, maybe four years ago now when we started saying we're going to set the levy limit at a limit and work, try to see if we can work our way down. And I think um, I'll, every time that we have said that, we've managed to come down with a levy. So I'm feeling, I feel less um, stressful about nailing it in the first four weeks because I know that we can find resources and as was mentioned I'm um, in this conversation, you know, um, if we get some support from federal funding earmarks from our state, our U.S. senators or U.S. representative, we could see um, budget opening up in some um, spots over the course of the next few months. So um, setting the levy limit, though, does just give us our guideposts that we work around um, until we set our final budget levy in uh, December, right, Holly? Is that December? Correct. Okay. Correct. December 8th. <laughs> I think I'd know that by now. Okay, so um, so I don't have any questions for Ms. Houston. Does anyone else have questions for Ms. Houston or about our budget process? No. 
All right. All right, great. Well, we got the first one done. Um, and we will continue on this, you know, on this kind of fast track as we head towards our levy, uh, setting our levy limit. But thanks, folks, for your participation here today. Um, we'll look for a follow up from Mr. Hom and Ms. Houston in the days to come. And then just a reminder, we are uh, getting our uh, materials coming in uh, in advance of our meeting. So we have an opportunity to check out what's going to be presented and be prepared uh, when we get our presentation. So thanks one and all for our work here today. And we, since there is nothing else to come before us, we will be adjourned until later. Thank you.